Okay, you ready? Do you hear, you hear anything? Okay, can you hear me? All right.
Okay. We'll get started in about two minutes. Hey guys. Okay, this is Mike Masterson with the Reynolds Company here in Houston. We're gonna get started with our um, September users group. Um, thanks for everyone who's here. First of all, uh, I guess by a show of hands, is everyone aware that Rockwell is having their automation fair in November? Who's going? Yay! Well, I have some not, okay, great. This is all good. Just to let you know what it is, this is Rockwell's largest trade show they have. This is basically where we get to see stuff that we're gonna see next year for real. Um, I, I like going to it, because actually I, all, everything I've told you this year that you should be seeing next year, if it's not there at Automation Fair, then I have lied to you. So hopefully it's all gonna be shown there. Um, it's November 20th and 21st is the actual Automation Fair. And the 18th and 19th, the Monday, Tuesday before that is the Process System Users Group. That is a pay class or a pay seminar to go to. Automation Fair is free. Um, I have some flyers on it. Feel free to come up and grab one if you have any questions on it. Um, we do have hotel packages. We're not doing airfare out of the office, but we do have hotel space booked. So feel free to get with me and if you're online listening to this just be you can go to our website or or just search rockwell automation fair and you should be able to see the registration information um i will say one more time it is truly it's the best trade show that rockwell has so if you can make it please do now to get started um we're going today we're talking about um thin manager which is a Rockwell software that you, some of you might have exposure to. Um, and we're also going to be going over Factory Talk Asset Center. This is not going to be a real slide heavy day. So it's, we're not going to PowerPoint you to death. We do have some um, demos that work this morning. So we're sure, pretty sure they're going to work today. But these things are always kind of iffy. So we're going to give it a shot. So uh, Thin Manager is the way we provide content. Oh, okay. 
just want to make sure. All right, Thin Manager is our software package for delivering content in our HMI system. This is our Factory Talk View SE distributed system. Many of you have used Factory Talk View before. There, many of you are familiar with uh, Machine Edition, which is basically what a panel view is that can be run on a panel view or a, a standard screen, or Factory Talk View standalone, which is basically a standalone station. Um, currently, we're, we've been trying to push a lot more client server, and Thin Manager actually gives us the ability to actually control the content going out. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. And the content you see here, these various sources here, we have some that will be using remote desktop and we have some that will be shadowing VNC like you would do with let's say a panel view plus. Um, we can also use um, Microsoft OS systems too. We have an application WinTMC which can be put on a Microsoft box and still work also. So our traditional control rooms that we've seen ah, take up a lot of resources. It almost makes me wish I, I was selling the PC boxes instead of uh, the software part of it. Typically we have our, our operating systems, our application files, antivirus, moving parts, and then USB access. We have that for one system. Then we add it for all these systems. So what are, what's the pain point with this? I'll take suggestions from you guys. Well, for one thing, um, just maintaining each one as a separate facility. Let's take a look at the issues with um, uh, network security on it. Each one is the separate. Um, virus software, each one of these have to be touched separately. So what we've been promoting is more of a client server type architecture. Everything residing on the server or, or duplicate servers, then using relatively inexpensive zero client boxes. Um, we are, that, that's where we are trending where we're going with this. So the way it works is um, any, any, our devices when they're hooked up, are going to go out and, and pull and ask for what type of information you're going to need at your terminal. So the firmware is delivered to the client. Um, it's, I believe it's like a 15 meg file. So it takes a half second to get delivered to the terminal. There's, it doesn't really take any time to do this. Then the, the customer profile is delivered and there's a couple ways we can do this. Um, is it based on login credentials? Uh, are we using, let's say, a QR code? Are we geofencing it using GPS? That's how we decide what information gets to that customer. And then the content is delivered. So that one person, that engineer, is always going to get his screen that he needs for that section of the plant. And the big benefit on this one is once it once you decide what content you're getting, you're not having to deal with where the content is coming from and installing the software on every single box. It could be defined by the location, by the user. So every single time you can be getting different content and you can also do it from third party systems. Yes, this is, so this is not, this is an open architecture. There's many a Wonderware system that is running this thin manager software. So we're agnostic to the actual HMI system. Keep that in mind. I'm not that we're, we're grasping here stuff, but this software is, is good for other uses also. So typically on the, um, it also makes it very easy to set up for a, a failover and a redundancy package. Um, as far as redundancy, what it is basically is it's a, it's a licensing part. Basically you're licensing it for a redundant package and the content's delivered, and the content will follow you around based on how you set it up. Okay, whoops, did I go back too many slides? Okay, uh, certain things we're doing, if you go look at our uh, sample system or demo system we have out here, we're actually using Thin Manager software. If you notice, we have the screen quoted 
out. So we're able to quad or tile the screens. Um, and in this case, our, our TV out there, we're doing four screens off of it. Um, we can also mirror a panel view using VNC. So I'm bringing that content. We can also use multi-monitor, up to five monitors. And again, now we can introduce an outside video source for security or if we're having a camera on something for condition monitoring purposes, um, that can be added into it also. And this is real simple, easy, fast setup. And also something fairly new to me is virtual screening. Where this is different from tile is these are all, what you're seeing here is actually four different sessions running on the same screen at the same time. Um, it's not click and expand, you're just seeing the four different sources. And in this case, I think what, what we're running in is a, uh, whoops, we're running two SE applications, um, maybe a, a trending software, and we're also running a factory talk view ME all on one screen. Okay, uh, you want to talk to a little bit about this, please? Yeah, what we're doing here is, so we call it relevance. So if you, any of you are familiar with Thin Manager, we've called it relevance users. That's really just the mobility part of it. It's already built into Thin Manager. But what you'll see is you'll get to choose where the content is coming from. So Mike mentioned uh, geofencing. So that's either Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, GPS. So like if you have content, you're on an iPad, you get close to something, you can automatically get a session onto the iPad. And as you walk away, it will automatically get logged out. As you start looking at also a couple of the examples and what's on the demo box there is a little uh, RF ideas. Basically, you take your RFID uh, badge scan in that you usually use at the office, tie that into your user access. So now you not only have your username and password, but you also have it where it's your uh, two-factor authentication where you have to be in front of the machine, in front of the, the skid to be able to do anything. So all of that is enabled as part of that user content. It's a good way of the, to adding on to your security, not just relying on your Microsoft security. It gives you another way to do it, what works in your plant. It could be anything from putting QR codes on particular skids, so someone walking around with an iPad can scan the, the QR code and bring up exactly what displays he needs for that operation. And what you can see from the picture is under the user content there, if you're logged in as either maintenance or administrator, you might want to be able to get into the code. So at that point is showing you uh, Studio 5000 in the same environment that you would have been looking at HMI, but it's not both installed on the same box. Everything is coming from the servers. Just some, some examples of, of some of the things we can use. Uh, again, currently we're using QR code. Um, they are working on uh, facial recognition. It's not in the release yet, but actually I still think that's supposed to be an add-on to version 11, which is what we're at now. So that is coming in the near future. And if any of you have gone or will be planning to go at Automation mm -hmm. Fair, they usually Fire have things. a good setup on, on this where they're showing all the different features. In the past, they've done the Vuzix um, AR glasses. They've also done the Microsoft HoloLens. So both of those are apps that uh, get installed where it's basically just the Thin Manager app launched on those setups. So. These are uh, different aspects of the mobility. The, the biggest thing is on this takeaway is, whoops, is Thin Manager before it was integrated into the Rockwell product line used its own licensing. We now have moved it to a factory talk licensing scheme. So um, it, we don't have the headaches that we possibly might have had before with the old licensing. Um, If you're not using a Rockwell product, you can still use the old licensing that existed previously before Rockwell acquired Thin Manager. So, yeah, so, and there are some of those customers out there that may or maybe they're using it on DCSs or something else. Um, so you can use that non factory talk licensing if you still want to do that. We're, we're maintaining both licenses going forward. 
So our sample architectures, if any of you have put any of our SE systems together, it's easy to say you just buy an SE package, but there's a lot of software and how all this stuff goes together. These are our typical configs for a small 10, um, 10 terminals, 20 terminals, and 50 terminals. Um, as you see, as you get larger, things get more involved in what you need, and this doesn't really require, isn't really addressing even the way the servers are set up. So it, it can get fairly complicated, but this is a good test of how our typical systems would be set up, any of our SC distributed systems. So uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to most of you who have uh, worked with this before. So. Okay, now this is looking at some of our competitors. Um, one thing you notice that Citrix and Dell Weiss uh, will tell you, or they will say they do basically the same thing as Thin Manager, but they're mainly based on the server side of the application, not the client side. We have all the hooks for the geofencing built into it, which they don't have as, as part of the solution. So we, for, and we're the only ones who are really approaching the industrial environment. The others, that's just their enterprise system, a standard one. It doesn't really look at our um, unique needs out in the field. Yeah, one of the things Mike mentioned is, so it's a content delivery system, so it doesn't matter what the content is. Anything that's part of the control system, whether it's the servers, the HMIs, <coughs> the reporting software, or even the panel views and things of that nature, all of that is content that can be delivered to the devices. The big differentiation on the Thin Manager side is the actual device itself is something that we're managing. So you know, when we look at Citrix, Dellwise, to Mike's point, that's all server-based. So in most cases, it's just a user and it provides you the window into Windows. So you get your start, you get a chance to almost like just a standard remote desktop. Whereas on this, we're managing the end device whether it's an iPad, whether it's a thin client, that environment, that box is what we're managing. And at that level, you can set up the mobility, who's logging in and the different content and that can be assigned ahead of time and then you can also set up policies. So it's really easy to replace a unit when you're out in the field without having to do any configuration to the actual units and you don't have to save anything to the actual units. So that's a big difference on what you would see from a standard either Citrix or Dell Wise, which, where it's usually at that point, it's more IT based. You're just launching a new image set. Okay, and part of the new licensing agreement, this is something Rockwell hasn't done traditionally. Basically we're offering you, our, the customers are being offered volume licensing now. So it is a quantity based type system now. So you see as you get larger, um, you, the discount applies. And I know this is really a marketing class and we're not talking about the price, but where I'm going with this is, um, let me go backwards. We're now able to divide up the actual uh, number of uh, stations to anywhere you want. So if you buy a hundred stations, those could be a hundred different sites if you wanted to. Uh, where traditionally where we sold the uh, Thin Manager in five pack increments or 10 or 25 pack, and they were generally tied to the site, not very flexible. So this allows us to break it down. This is actually a, a big deal for the people who are currently using it and makes life easier when uh, trying to figure out how to deploy this. Yeah, so one of the biggest asks that we would always get is, so we settle it in, and to Mike point, we sold it in a five pack. So the smallest number of devices that you can manage was a five pack, but if you had a single or a dual that you just needed, you had to get the five pack and you just had extra licensing uh, attached to it. So now you can go down and buy just one single one. So if you're just doing a smaller uh, segment and you want to grow over time, you just add more licensing to it, just like you do anything else on the Rockwell side. Mm -hmm. Send us, uh, yeah, we'll talk and we'll I'll figure out how to do a swap over. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did the swap on our end as of October 28th or so. Yeah, or and I just actually September. was working, just working August. on a job two weeks ago where I had to do the same thing. So it can be done. All right. Um, 
now the gotchas. Whenever you put this stuff together, I, I know this from personal experience mm -hmm. now, um, having just worked on a job, is you need Microsoft licensing behind this to make yourself legal. Um, just remember, we're from the most part, we are not including the remote desktop cows. So those have to be added to the job. Just to let you know, us, we as the Reynolds companies, we do have access to the cows. We, we do volume licensing, so if you do need them, let us know. Um, it's not a money maker for us, but as a convenience, we can always offer it for you. So if, if you guys aren't familiar, Cal is a client access license on the Windows yeah. side of it. So the idea is when you're using a workstation from uh, Windows, let's say Windows 7, Windows 10, if you remote dot, desktop into that, it black screens because you can only have one session running at a time. But when you're looking at a server environment, so Windows Server 2016, for example, if so, uh, somebody else, so if two users log into the exact same server and do remote desktop, both of them have an independent session. By default, each one comes uh, essentially with the number of CALs is the number of connections that you can do. So as you start building this out, the difference here is normally you would have to buy little Dell workstation boxes, install all the equipment, do the antivirus, the USB keys, the security, like Mike mentioned at the beginning of it. So your entire facility might have 10 to 20 of these computers all running factory talk view SC client. If one of them died out in the field, you basically have to take a new computer, reinstall all the software, and it takes you a couple hours to get it back up and running to where you were. The environment here is running everything off of a server environment. So now you, you uh, set up one uh, Windows 2016 image with all the software that's running on it. And all we're essentially doing is remote desktoping into that one box. So all the sessions, all the devices and thin clients are all creating a single session to that one box. And that's the only box that you really have to maintain. But what you do have to do is for the number of devices, the number of clients that are going to be accessing it, you need to buy the appropriate Windows licensing because Microsoft on that side of it wants to make sure that they're covering their basis on the kind of Microsoft EULA for the number of users that you're tying into. So you can support Linux, but the actual thin manager itself uh, is Windows based. So from a virtual environment and from what you can present, the thin client can load up a Linux box on it, but the actual environment doesn't have a Linux. Right. So as far as, so like an example of that guy over there. Uh, so Mike mentioned there's the uh, multi-monitor and then also the virtual screening. So if you tile it, so think of like IP cameras, I can have 25 independent IP cameras, independent sessions on one monitor. And that's essentially one connection. Now with the virtual screening, I can do four separations of that 25 each. I would never want you to do that but you can. So think of a big kind of the benefit there is a 4K monitor. The 4K monitor basically just means it's four HD displays in one. So I can do uh, where it's usually you're designing all your HMIs to like 1920 by 1080p. It's four of those. So a 4K can be split up into that four independent sessions. But if you wanted a tile inside of that, you can do more than that. I'll be talking about licensing, but essentially on the Rockwell side, that's one license. So no matter how many sessions, you just need the bandwidth to handle how much you're actually displaying. And you guys have to make the decision, does it work for the operators that are trying to do something if all of a sudden I'm creating like these little screens. So, but you'll see once we get into the demo and you guys can see, or, uh, see it, what Thin Manager does is it automatically scales everything. So it doesn't matter what resolution you're presenting it on, whatever you give it, it scales to it. Now, I think most of the people in this this session here currently are, are more of the integrator uh, uh, world. And I just want to point out, when it comes to the Microsoft licensing, instead of employing it, if you talk to your customers, a lot of times their internal IT departments want to pull from their own volume licenses mm -hmm. for the RDSs. That helps them keep track of it. Always ask that question before you automatically assume you're going to supply them. Um, a lot of times it's more convenient for the customers to use their own internal volume licensing 
than for you to provide it. Just questions to ask, because this is kind of a gotcha that people forget at towards the end of the, the process. And that's it. And Ready no, to talk you're not allowed a little to leave demo. It, Any questions on this? This was a kind of a brief overview before we go into more detail on this, but we're going to do the labs at the very end. Yeah. Yeah, David yelled at us, if we try to do the demos and mess up his system, he's going to get messed. <laughs> um, Go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of the, it's not because it doesn't have to be. So what you'll see on our end and what is also a little different is we call them a zero client. So if you've seen those, basically a zero client means there's no Windows interface and realistically, there's no operating system on the thin client environment itself. So the box that we're using inside of that demo, all it asks for is the IP address to, for thin manager. It will automatically connect, especially if you're routing based off the switches. It'll get its profile, gets the file, but everything is coming from the server. Exactly. Yeah. You're basically streaming it to the the environment, which is also nice because you don't need to have as much bandwidth when it comes to connecting into it. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, we seriously don't require anything at all. Because the, the, the difference was in the past, in most cases, for anybody that's tried to do a quad monitor set up on a traditional computer, you need to get a pretty uh, beefy video card. In most cases, you needed something that can handle either four HDMI cables or something to that effect. And if you try to go above four, all of a sudden you were buying these big, gigantic video cards or special cables. The difference here is because everything is at the server side of it, all you have to do is buy a thin client can, that can support the amount of connections. So we have one that can do up to seven 4K monitors. And essentially the box is about this big. Yeah. So all of the processing power and all the everything needs to be at the server, not at the thin client. We do have our own thin clients also, and we're we pu we pull them out. Of this we want this more be more based on software, but we do have zero clients that from single monitor up to four. So um, we'll, we'll gladly talk to you offline about that. The thin client doesn't have, have one essentially. Yeah. So it's based off a, the difference is on ours, they're called thin manager ready. A thin manager ready is tying into the thin manager software itself. It will run on windows on that side. So you would install, it's about a 350 meg software package that sits on top of a windows environment. And that's usually the way that we usually have it set up is on the remote desktop box or terminal server. That, Right, at that point, and that would all be at, at the, server the server side of it. But that's that's the thing. Instead of twenty disparate locations, you're doing it all at one centralized location. So, so if you've ever looked at a virtual system, and I know we have, uh, in, in a virtual environment, if you do a remote desktop box and you can provide, let's say, ten sessions off the same Windows environment, that's only one antivirus setup, and everything would be done at the server. So when you do patching, when you do any of that. It's all done from that one central location. Instead of having to, in the past, you would have to patch every single Windows client, then come back to the server, restart everything, and make sure it all comes back. In this environment, as soon as you patch the main server, every single one of the clients, all you have to do is turn them on and turn them off. But there's no software, there's no patching, and you can also prevent the USB access. So if I tie into a little USB stick on the front of a thin client, it does nothing. By default, the only thing that's enabled is a keyboard and mouse, but you can do it. Yes, it would be tying into either DHCP or you can manually type it in. And um, the, the Windows applications called WinTMC mm -hmm. is a free download right. off, off the uh, um, Thin Manager website. So the, the traditionally, that's a lot of stuff, but any Microsoft device, that's where you're going to be running on it. So we're gonna switch gears just a little bit, still talking about software, and then I'll kind of try to tie it back in at the end. Uh, so how many of you have played, seen, heard of Factory Talk Asset Center? Okay. 
after the uh, for anybody that doesn't know, my name is Luis. I'm the solution architect with Rockwell. Uh, so that's why I want to burn those shirts. <laughs> um, so what you'll see from Asset Center is our, it's our change management solution. It is still server-based, so it's going to run Windows 2016 more than likely. And this will be a one centralized repository for all of the control system environment. So when we lo I'll talk about assets. Assets for us are is basically a smart device with a configuration file. A control logics, a compact logics, a panel view, a factory talk view, a stratic switch, all of those are a smart asset that we want the configuration file. What we do is we save those configuration files in a central repository, and then we do a backup comparison while it's online to the device to see if there's changes between the two databases. So if it sees a control logics file that's running on the controller, different from what it finds on its database, it will then upload the latest and greatest, create a new revision, and then send out an email with all of the changes in a PDF format. And it's down to the run level. So you'll see the archive and disaster recovery. So from one central location, you can check files in and out. So you can set security policies in place on how you're doing that. It will also accept third party files. So we are able to collect from Word, Excel, and then third-party equipment. The way that we handle it is most of the licensing and the upper-end features are gonna be very Rockwell-centric, but we have solutions around third-party as well. The other pieces is an audit trail. So as we start growing more and more into the kind of the Rockwell environment, down to the HMI level, I can track who's going into an HMI and logging in, changing set points. So all of the button pushes, all the changes from each location, including thin clients. So again, if I have a walk around iPad program, I can see who's logging in, who's making changes from that site. Bless you. Are you using that with the call? Yes. Yeah, so what, what ends up happening in the background is uh, for anybody that's installed any of the factory talk software, there's always a services platform that ties into it. What Asset Center does is it grabs all the logs and creates one centralized file. And all of that would get saved into the SQL database. The security side of it is kind of based uh, directly on the factory talk side of it. So you can build in the factory talk security and those type of implementations directly into Asset Center. So you're changing the policy. The main idea here is we want to prevent people from taking their USB key or having copies of a file on different laptops, create everything in a centralized spot, and you check the file in and out so you always have the latest and greatest file. Some of the things that you guys will see when we talk about Asset Center is that there's a main Asset Center server, so that's what houses the database. It uses SQL Express, so that has in the latest version, it's a 10 gig top end you can buy a full SQL standard license and just continue that size. So that will work. There's an asset center client, which when we show you the demo is the runtime portion of it. That would be either at the server environment or at the local clients. So the local client would be your laptops. So essentially anytime you check out a file, you're getting it to your local box. Asset center itself is read only. It never writes anything to the controller. But if you think about it, once you check the file out and it's your engineering workstation, whether it's the dedicated client or whether it's your laptop, your license kicks in, you now have a full read-write environment. And that's outside of Asset Center. Asset Center is just a tool to be able to get the file in. And then the agent is what does the work in the background. So when I go out from the Asset Center server to go out to the control logics or the compact logics while it's online to do its work, it's basically using RS links, factory talk links, the same environment that you would use using Studio 5000, but it all happens in the background. So. As you start growing into it, basically all we're doing is we're licensing the server and the total number of assets, the agents, the clients, all of that comes with. So you can just expand and make this a bigger system or a smaller system, depending on how you need it. So the standalone to the distributed is the exact same licensing. The only thing that changes is how many overall assets do you have tied into? Is it 50 or is it 5,000? So if we get into the 5,000 realm, we start separating this thing out, adding more pieces of it so that you can do some load balancing.
you guys feel free to ask questions. But uh, so what we do, we call it disaster recovery. I call it backup and prepare because it usually makes a little bit more sense. Disasters are usually a bad thing in our industry. All this means is you get away from having to name the file with a time and date stamp of when you created it or saying final one, final two, final three. It just has a single name and there's multiple revisions that get saved inside of the SQL database. So if you ever needed to go back uh, a version, so if somebody goes out, does work, or if it's you guys, and all of a sudden something breaks one day, two days, three days uh, down the road, you now have the backup saved on your system, push that in, and then you can see the comparison and see what difference has happened. So, uh, go ahead. No, it's a system-wide asset management, not only for Rockwell Solutions. So, almost like a condition mod put your condition monitoring equipment in. right. So it wouldn't yeah. go to that level. So we do have solutions that tie in to get into the work order side of it. This one is more on the physical asset uh, perspective and what it's doing from the con uh, configuration side of it. So if it's a work order and I need to be able to tie in and say, okay, something is breaking, this isn't tracking the kind of runtime hours, let's say. Yeah, we have the ability on the Rockwell side to be able to kind of tie that into a bigger system all the way up through ERP or uh, whatever we might do on that side of it. What this does is as it starts tracking, like to your point on the historian side, when we start looking at that, we would pair that with a historian system and then give you a reporting software that ties into all of it. So a no on our end, it would just be like a vantage point. Uh, so that's usually the, the typical setups that I look at from architecture would be asset center, historian, and vantage point. So now you're collecting all of the asset information and all the configuration from your control side of it. Then you're also looking at the uh, process information. So how for three years, I want to see all the process variables on Historian. And then on the reporting side of it, I want to check to see who's checked my files out, what the audits look like for an eight hour shift. And then also, if something happens, I want to see the alarms in 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after and show them all on the screen. We can, but not with this is on the Rockwell side, we can. There's other stuff that does that. One other thing that comes with the audits is, so this becomes powerful because again, it's kind of like a big brother. I don't know how many of you guys have done it, but in the past, if I went to go troubleshoot something, what I would do is log into Studio 5000, tie in, make a couple of rung edits, put it back exactly how it was after I was done testing, and then I, would, I was done. To a standard system, if I'm doing a comparison between the control logics file and what I have in the database, that is not a change because I put it back exactly how it was. The audit trail, on the other hand, is tracking every single thing that I did and from what laptop I did. So that becomes the kind of the differentiation side of it where it's looking at the time and date stamp, it's looking at the computer and the, the actual location that it was done on, who was logged in at the time, and then what changes happened. You have to have the asset center client or tied into it. So the idea here is Imagine the rogue laptop idea. You have the full system, you have asset center on top, everything is being tracked. And then the rogue integrator comes in, plugs in an ethernet uh, card into the control logics chassis, gets into the controller and starts making modifications. So that could be the system integrator, that can be the OEM. What asset center would do is track all the changes that are happening at the controller side of it, but it wouldn't be able to see the audits of the actual changes. So as you start seeing this, this is part of the kind of security policy that needs to be in place. Who has access to the information and how far do you have to lock down the control? Because that, that takes an extra step as well. But what it would do is asset center, whenever a controller 
sees changes, it can send a flag to Asset Center saying somebody is making modifications to my code. If they're not part of the kind of Asset Center Factory Talk family because it's a temporary user or guest user, the controller will at least notify Asset Center saying there is a change that's happening. You need to be aware of it. It may not be able to track all of the audits until the next time it does a backup. Yeah, the remote desktop's usually gonna be a little bit easier because of the fact that if you're remoting desktop, you're already in the system. So you would want it, like if you do a jump box to get into Studio 5000, you would want the Asset Center client installed on that so that no matter who jumps into it, whoever goes into the remote desktop box, now is being tracked as part of the system. So that's some stuff that we do as part of like the IDMZ and a couple of the other security pieces that we play into. This make sense? One of the later features, I think it was after uh, starting in version eight. Uh, so we introduced something called an asset inventory. So traditionally speaking, asset center was as useful as the information that you would provide it. So if it didn't have the controller as part of the uh, kind of configuration, it never knew to go check it. So um, if you're missing something, you wouldn't be able to see anything. What this now does is it goes out and it scans the network you have three options. One is SIP, which is Common Industrial Protocol or the equivalent of Ethernet IP. So basically anything that's on our Ethernet network. You also have the switches, so you can do SNMP uh, switches and you can see all the different switches that are on there. And then you can also do what's called WIMS, which is basically a Windows inventory on the software side of it. So you can do three separate scans and bring all of that information back into Asset Center. So if you find everything on your Ethernet side, so anything that's Ethernet IP, control net, or device net. So think of a sniffer that'll go out through the network, go down through the levels of your bridging network and find all of the serial numbers, all of the firmware that you have, all of the IO cards, all of that would be brought back into Asset Center. And you can do two things with it. If you find any assets that don't currently exist, you can then add them into your tree as your assets and now you're saved. Or you can also rescan this, let's say once a week, to see if any modifications has ha have happened to your actual network. Did somebody go in there and turn things off? Did somebody add something all of a sudden to your system? So all of that would be part, and that now becomes part of the same disaster recovery mantra. So a couple of updates. This was last year, so version eight. One of the big things that we added is for that acid inventory that I talked about, you can now also tie that into the PCDC site. So if any of you have gone to our download site, the Product Compatibility and Download Center, you can now see the life cycle status of everything that you have inside of Asset Center. So all of you are still trying to maintain a Micrologics 1500. Yeah. It will tell you stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So time to upgrade. So the caveat on this obviously is that you need internet access to your Asset Center. I can count the number of customers I have in one hand that have that. There is an offline file option. So anything that you scan out using the asset inventory, there's an export feature. That file can be uploaded directly into the PCDC website. And that will give you an offline representation of everything in their lifecycle status. So that's telling you whether it's active, active mature, or if it's bloody red and you need to kind of get rid of it and replace it. The latest option that we have right now for Asset Center is version nine. It now supports Windows 2016. So that would be our default version that we'd look at for you guys to install. As you can see, there's quite a few things that got in here because of the fact that we're talking about Thin Manager and Factory Talk View. One of the big updates that we did is we now have Factory Talk View SE as an asset. So in the past, what we've had to do is create a binder around the folder structure and essentially just add the entire folder into Asset Center. As, and Factory Talk View SE and the Stratic switches are, are now available assets. All you need is a Rockwell license to be able to do that backup and compare. All of those will show up. So as part of the demo, we'll kind of show some of the tie-ins. The other big piece that's here is now when you do the asset inventory and you want to see the lifecycle side of it, you will go down all the way to the IO cards. 
So the, the last release was just at the controller level for the lifecycle. Now it's down to the IO cards as well. Uh, so that won't. No, no, it's, 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 no, <laughs> no, I know what you're talking about. Essentially, the for the people on the phone, when you install Factory Talk View, you can only have one version at a time on each computer. So if you're doing multiple versions, what Asset Center would do is it would allow you to save the different versions without doing a configuration change. So if you had a backup of a V9, a V10, and a V11 application, all of it would get saved, but it would not change anything when it comes to, exactly. There is, there's some super secret ways of trying to go back, but it's usually not worth the trouble. Right. So <laughs> I, I've, I've in my past had to go back to older versions of Factory Talk View SE, and I've also had to do older versions of Studio 5000, or at the time, Ars Logics 5000, where there's a will, there's a way, but in most cases, it's not worth the effort. But there is a way. Yes, have a backup, that, that's the key there. Uh, so a couple of things, just so you guys are aware, as far as sizing this. Traditionally speaking, if you're talking about 250 to 500 assets, that's the total number that you're looking at. More than likely you have one asset center server with the client installed on it and the agent installed on it and that's probably all you have other than more clients. Because from a low end perspective, one agent can scan out about, on average we're looking at about, uh, what is it, 12, it's 10 assets per hour. So about 120 to 200 assets per day on just a schedule change. So more than likely you're not scanning every single one of these every day. So that's how we start scaling the agents. We have a knowledge base article that kind of walks through how we would handle critical assets, how we would handle kind of the scanning on it. But what we're looking at generally speaking is about 10 assets. So 10 control logics chassis that I'm gonna hit in an hour to do a backup and comparison. If I deem to do more at the same time, I would just simply add more agents. And like I said, there's no cost for the agents. It's just another Windows box. So an agent needs to be installed either on a Windows 10 box or a Windows Server box. Or and like, image. Or, yeah, or image, it can all be <coughs> virtualized. The idea here is all it's doing is, like I said, it's factory talk links or artist links in the background. So it needs to have Studio 5000 installed. It does not need to be licensed. As far as how big this can get, up to 100 clients running all at the same time. So if you can imagine, that could be multiple clients installed out there. It just, at the same time, I need, and the max is really 100, and it's not a hard limit. So I'm not gonna cut it off at a 101. It just, at that point, I say, okay, you know what you're doing. Agents, we can now go up to 35 agents. So like I said, there's a big difference when I start talking about 100 assets versus 5,000 assets. So if you guys are going past the 100, 200 mark, just talk to us. We can kind of work you through what the architecture would look like on a bigger system like that. And then obviously, we would support as part of one factory talk directory, one factory talk application set, one asset center server. There is, I don't think I have it in here, but there is also a web component to this. So the client can be, while well, it's read only, so I can see just the reports on it, HTML5. So if I wanted to, that would be another client that I can look at that would be separate than the standard installs. So as far as what it can support, 2016 all the way back to 2008, when it comes to servers, your standard uh, web client functionality. And then the, the SQL side of it also down to 2008, by default we would install 2016. It comes with Express, 
if you want the standard edition for the full amount of capacity that you can do on this, it would just be a license fee. You tell us about it, or you tell Reynolds about it, we'll put that in. Any questions? So, exactly. So the way it works is the back. I think somebody's asking a question. Uh, the backup and comparison tool. Uh, what it does is when it goes out to a control object and it finds a change, it's automatically opening up the compare and merge tool in the background. So if you guys have ever played around with that in Studio Five Thousand, there's a bunch of tools that almost everybody ignores, but there's about twenty different tools, including like the clock update tool and things of that nature. One of them is a compare and merge. If you launch that manually and you want to use it for your own benefit, you can do up to three ACD files at one time, merge it into one, and you can pick and choose what wins. So if you wanted to steal the UDTs from one, the AOIs from another, the routines from another, you can mix and match and then create one ACD file. From a development point of view, one controller can support up to five instances of Studio 5000 connected at the same time. I don't always recommend that unless you guys know exactly who's working on what. But when they are making multiple changes, you can do that designation and just say, okay, you work on this, I'll work on this, I'll work on this, and then just merge it all together into one final system. The other thing that I'll mention is inside of Asset Center, what it allows you to do is it's doing a comparison on the latest file in the database to what's in the controller. If you start making modifications and say, I'm gonna test something, you can choose to pin the latest version, check the file out, start making modifications and save a revision 10 when there was already a revision nine and ignore that when it comes to the comparison, but use that as my working file to make modifications. Once I'm ready for it, I push it into the controller, then I remove the pin and promote the, old, uh, the newer version that I had in there. You have a lot of flexibility on doing that. You also have the ability to ignore if somebody checked the file out, because what it does is when you check the file out, it locks everybody else out. The whole point is one person is making changes. I don't want anybody else to do it. That person goes home, they forget, uh, they forget to check in, they get sick, whatever the case might be. If you're an administrator, you can go in there and either ignore what they did, or you can still get a workable copy. So you have a lot of flexibility there. The whole point is to be able to monitor and maintain who has access to what? <laughs> that would be a good question for me to go yell at people because I've been asking for that. So roadmap, yes, that is kind of where Asset Center will eventually kind of play into it. When you look at our uh, documentation for the 62443 on the cybersecurity side of it, both hygiene, plant PX, anything that you might look at, Asset Center plays a huge part of the detect. Because while we're not necessarily preventing anybody from doing anything with Asset Center, we're definitely monitoring and maintaining to see who did something. And also the most important part, how do I recover? that's the whole big point of asset center is the disaster recovery piece if something dies if if somebody goes in and you lose the controllers and you you blue screen on a computer that's out there you have all of the backups in one central spot and across, and across multiple systems and that's why you should be at automation fair november 20th and 21st to ask the product managers those specific questions the so the other thing also just to be aware of it while this one does a lot of the assets it doesn't necessarily look at network traffic so we do have another product called factory talk network manager so for anybody that has a toolkit you guys have a license for factory talk network manager it allows you to configure and monitor the stratic switches so you can then see a full topology of your entire network including down to the controllers and the io and now it can also bridge through the backplane. So you can see DLR rings, you can see through an ethernet drop to another network, but all of that will give you alerts and also an inventory on it. 
So we have those two kind of tools, one for the networking side and one for the control side of it. But eventually we're trying to figure out a way to be able to kind of show that properly. A lot of the documentation around cybersecurity is around all of those products. Me too. Me too. <laughs> We're, we'll talk you about that next it. users group. We're, we're trying to come up with a, a, a good message because believe me, when they hit it, us with it, it was kind of confusing. So, there, so yeah, to his point, we're gonna be rolling that out as we get more information as to how it's gonna really affect you guys. But you guys have seen it from us. We're moving to kind of a subscription and perpetual model. So we have a website now for the software toolkits the toolkits are uh, all that's changing is now they're not going to be called toolkits anymore they're going to be software bundles so it, it'll give you guys more flexibility to be able to kind of manage that from a web page environment you'll be able to see all your users and now you can assign them the serial number instead of having to always like copy the code and move that around but we'll get you more information as uh, we see that because it's going to be throughout not just for the toolkits but we'll see that going through the entire system we feel your pain. <laughs> I know. The point is we, might, we want to make sure that we don't get rid of your cheese. It just might move around a little bit. Can you give me an extra sandwich for that supplies for right now? A cookie? Really quick, let me check to see if somebody asked. Uh, Chris, online, it will... So technically it will work from a cloud server, but I would not recommend it. So reach out to me and send me an email and we can talk through the architecture because that'll be a little bit more of a discussion than yes or no. Um, okay, so I'm gonna transition to a couple of updates that we've talked about. Some of you have already seen this, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. Factory Talk View SE, so when we're looking at the HMI side on the computer-based side, we. As Mike mentioned, we're typically looking at more of the distributed setup now, especially with what we can do within Manager and how we're bundling the licenses on these. We're trying to get more users to kind of use one central HMI server with multiple clients. So as of version 11, there was quite a few updates. I kind of highlighted some of the main ones. As I mentioned with the tie into Asset Center, Factory Talk View SE is now an asset. So I just back up the entire SC application. The other thing that I'll show you is all of those audits that I was talking about inside of Asset Center can now be viewed inside of the HMI without having to open up Asset Center. So as long as Asset Center is part of the system, I can tie into it and show you all of the audits that are tied into it. So that example that I was talking about, the, you get an alarm and I wanna see 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after, you can do it directly from the HMI system. You don't need Vantage Point on top of it. So that gives you some flexibility there, especially for smaller systems. Uh, what we've done for, and I'll show it to you, it's called Trend Pro. So for anybody that hasn't used that before, we have the standard trending application inside of SE, and then we have what's called Trend Pro. So as a version, I think it was, nine potentially we added in the functionality of the vantage point report which is a lot more dynamic that has more abilities to it we launched that directly into sc we've now done tons of updates on it so that allows you to look at data logs it allows you to see real-time data historian information and now it's also tying into the asset center trending and also events so i'll kind of talk through that you can also collect from osi pi data so our factory talk historian SE is OSI Pi based. We now also can natively talk to OSI Pi. So you don't need necessarily process books or anything else. The HMI itself can do it. As long as it's part of the asset framework. Mm -hmm. We're basically trying to make sure you don't have to use any of it. Uh, Thin manager licensing, we will talk about that, but essentially what I'm uh, going to show you is it doesn't matter the number of clients or the number of pieces that you tie into one thin client box, it's one license. And then the other big piece is 
You guys should be aware of this. Nobody should be using HMI based alarms anymore that are inside of the tags structure. That was the old, old method. We now use alarm and events. If they're not using that, or if you're looking at a conversion, talk to us. We can show you the little work, work around to get that out of the way pretty easily. The other thing is uh, they've done two updates. The little application manager that used to be there is now only for ME, meaning that's only for the panel view side of it. Now the tool that was in place called the distributed SE um, backup and I think backup tool now does all of it. Anything that's SE will be part of that backup utility, whether it's standalone or distributed. So it's a free tool that's always installed anyway. It just, it gives you more fle uh, flexibility where you don't have to kind of package things up and it does all the copy and paste. If you're copying it from one system and moving it to another, it allows you to merge, re uh, override, or just install on a brand new server without having to override anything. So there's a lot of functionality that you see there. This will be part of the demo that we show, but this is uh, Trend Pro. So inside of the HMI, you're able to dynamically kind of tie into this. I can isolate the trending, I can overlay it all on top, I can click on it, move it around, I can even see a trace. So the nice functionality here is if I'm looking at something and I wanna do a quick little trace of the line and export it into a CSV Excel file, I can do it directly from the HMI. So it's just a button push up here. Here you're seeing what the tags are. The tags can come from different pieces of it. Each one's a pen, like you guys have probably seen in the past. And then what I'm showing here is not only the alarms, but I'm also showing you the, the information from Asset Center. So again, the audit logs. Who made a modification? Did somebody acknowledge the alarms? Did somebody change the set point from 70 to 72? All of that would be traced there and would show up on the graphs themselves. So if you click on it, you can see directly onto what you're doing. On this tie-in, the other thing that they're showing here is that if you guys are subscribing to the high performance graphics and the ISA 101, if you wanna make sure that everything's kind of gray scaled, we'll allow you to do that in the trend environment itself. So now you can kind of avoid a lot of the kind of pretty colors that we typically look at when it comes to a trend environment. I like this one just cause it shows you some of the benefits here. So. This gives you kind of the ease of use. You can create a lot of shortcuts inside of Trend Pro. So if you wanted to, you can create, kind of define what all your trend reports look like from one screen and just drag and drop. Anything that I click on here, even if I didn't configure it ahead of time. So a lot of the times you guys go in and create what all the users want to look at but a lot of the times you might get the phone call saying, hey, you missed a point on my trend. I want to uh, see about adding it. You don't have to get into the studio five uh, or the factory talk view studio environment. You essentially just have them open up Trend Pro. They can go, oh, wrong thing. They can go directly to where the information is located, whether it's live, historical, or even in the Pi database, and then just drag it in. And as soon as they do that, they have the option of being able to publish and save the report again. But once they do that, they're saving the template directly into their SE environment without ever having to open up the development software. So. It'll automatically add it to the tree that's there. So when they go away and they come back, it'll still be there and they just have to click on that kind of quote unquote report. Then manager SE licensing. Mike mentioned it, so Thin Manager as a version 11 now supports the factory talk licensing, so it's the same red envelope that you guys are used to. You have the option to still use the old licensing, so you can pick and choose. If you tell us, by default, we'll automatically give you the factory talk version. So if you need the other one, let us know. It will still work with all third party stuff, it's just how we manage it. It's a little factory talk licensing manager that's always on your boxes. You can set it up from a server environment, have everybody point to it. As we start looking at this, now that we're on version 11, you'll have your HMI server, your remote desktop box, your thin manager server that might be licensed. And all it means is it doesn't matter how many factory talk view SC client I'm putting on monitors. Like I said, I can support 
up to seven 4K monitors on this thing, it's one license. One thin manager license and one factory talk view client. Now, I can't say the same thing if you start launching Wonderware or something like that. That's, that's on them. But at least on our side of it. The other really nice thing that they did is when we're talking about the thin client environment where Mike is, if you log in and you're using the same uh, licensing or the username and password that you do for the domain, it will now get passed through all the way from the thin client environment all the way to the factory talk view client. So you only have to do a single sign on on one spot. So in most cases, what you had to do in the past is you logged into the thin client and then you still had to log into the software that you were using because they're kind of separate. Because if it's on the Rockwell side of it, we'll push that all the way through. <laughs> Liar. So you can, it depends on what you're trying to do. So uh, factory talk view SE is pixel based. So you do define what the, the resolution is, what your X and Y axis are. You can, you have two options. You can either launch it with what's called factory talk viewpoint. So if you've seen that, that's an HTML5 conversion of the existing screens. And that'll make it an HTML5 side of it. The other option is to push it into thin client because once it's displayed on the thin client side of it through thin manager, at that point, you can then start doing this. Mm. Right. So one of the things that you'll notice once we get into the demo that you're showing there, those are essentially four applications that are running at like 1280 by something. But based off what you decide, it'll scale it down to whatever size format you want. When it comes to a phone, whether it's an Android or an Apple phone, it will just launch to the size that you're doing there and you'll have the full environment of being able to do kind of multi-touch. We traditionally, so it is an application that launches on a Windows environment. Traditionally, we'll do uh, install it on a remote desktop box. It doesn't have to be there. It just, it, so it doesn't have to be on its own, I guess is what I'm saying. It can be on the HMI server, but the only reason I caution that is if you lose the HMI server, you also lose your thin manager session to the clients. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. So as you start getting into a bigger system, we traditionally have the HMI server and the thin manager and terminal server separate, but you can, there's nothing against it, especially for smaller systems. You did it to me again. There you go. When, when you take focus away from it, this no longer. <laughs> so this will kind of go to your question as far as where do you co-locate stuff? So one of the things, and I, we've talked about it in the past here, but one of the things that we've done recently is, and, and we just did an update to this, we have virtual templates. So what we do is we provide you a hard drive with the actual Windows environment and the applications already pre-installed. Typically speaking, that's all part of our DCS, Plant DX side of it. We normally do an HMI server, an engineering workstation, an operator client, historian, asset center. All of them are separate Windows images. We now also have a consolidated image for a smaller subset type system. So the idea here is if you're talking about a control system, it doesn't have to be a DCS. We're just, we're gonna put all the documentation as if it was a DCS, but we're looking at a control system environment that's 2000 uh, physical IO points and less, no more than 10 clients. And I think it's up to about 5,000 historian points. We're sizing this for to be launched on one box. The only thing that's not installed on it is Thin Manager. Te technically speaking, we would usually still want Thin Manager installed somewhere else, but I can tell you from demo environments, it will work with uh, launching it on uh, the actual PASI server and it'd still be okay. So again, there's nothing against it. It just where you put all your eggs in one basket type ideas, what you wanna look at. So what this does, it, Instead of a virtual template, this is actually running on an ISO file. So for anybody that's ever done that, an ISO file can be installed on a physical box. 
it would just replace your entire Windows environment with that ISO file. It basically, it's kind of like a full backup uh, Cronus idea. You can also use this to generate a virtual image. So what you'll see is if we were looking at this and we had one single consolidated pass, for anybody that hasn't seen pass from us, process automation system server. In the past, it's usually just meant a, a nice HMI server. In this case, it has Factory Talk View SE from the HMI environment, Factory Talk Historian, Factory Talk Asset Center, and Factory Talk Vantage Point. All of them are installed, including the Studio 5000 environment and all the development software. All of that is preloaded on that one box. So it, it's all working properly. You can vet that through your IT department. For anybody that has a toolkit, you can download it as part of your toolkit and use your toolkit license to activate it. So any of the virtual templates don't come with any Windows licensing and it doesn't come with any Rockwell licensing. You guys have to put that on, whether it's for your own development or you're using that to develop for a customer. So either or. As long as you have a toolkit. If you don't have a toolkit, you can then buy it from us essentially and go to the website and, and we provide you a part number and a license with the hard drive. So that's typically gonna be for like an end user that wants to buy it for their own system. SC, Asset Center, Historian. Um, so it's the HMI server, Historian, the SQL interface that's there and Asset Center. All of that tied into one, one spot. So most of the demos that you'll see from us going forward, a lot of the times is all a single box. We dump it all in there. So what was that? Uh, I do hidden. I can send it to you. Uh, it's looking at at least a minimum of about four vCPUs. Uh, so it's a pretty decent box and about 16 gigs of memory. Uh, we have it. So, we, we put it. Just install it. I had it install on a uh, one of the new Stratus standalone backup mm -hmm. boxes, which is twelve. Uh, that was twelve um, feet CPU. CPU and so if if you're looking at it, one of the kind of neater applications that we're looking at for this is if we put it all in one box, you can still connect to a like I said the two thousand points of I/O. It's a single server system. Now, if your customer or you guys are looking at options, you can still do a full virtualized environment, whether it's Dell, HP, or even our own industrial data centers. Stratus has a couple of options. So if you guys saw the user group that we did a couple uh, months ago, they have a little edge box called the X, uh, ZTC Edge. That little guy, you can buy a single node or you can buy it redundant. That's enough to launch one uh, pass C server. The, if you get the older uh, Pass C that we had, it was 2012. The latest one is 16. Mm -hmm. Only on standard edition. Only on standard edition. The, the, the 16 and the 24 core. So not on the data center license. But yes, that is a very big concern that you have. Kind of to my point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not on the express but on the, the standard. So one of the things just so you guys are aware also is a lot of times, even if you do have a smaller system, you still ask, do I need a redundancy? So you can still set this up as a redundant HMI server. Essentially all we do is launch two of them. You would only use the historian uh, and asset center on one of the boxes. So at that point, maybe you want to want to launch, you want to launch Thin manager on the other box or things of that nature. So you start looking at different setups there. But like I said, you can look at this for up to 10 uh, view clients. And you can launch this and actually Stratus has done a little bit of testing on the little ZTC edge to do thin manager with the PASC server. So if you have a larger environment at that point, we wouldn't do this. We would do the individual ones because once you're in a virtual environment, it's kind of easy to launch multiple images. But when you're talking about something consolidated, you got a smaller system, you're going onshore or offshore, a lot of the times you want to be able to kind of consolidate in everything into one or two machines. At that point, that's when we start looking at this guy here. So 
the 10 that we're showing there are by default just 10 clients because we, whether they're virtualized, thin clients, whatever they might be, there's still 10 connections. So we're basically looking at it. That could be the one thin client launching 10 clients on it. It's still 10 instances. So yeah, we're, no cheating and putting a, a, like five clients on one monitor and then put a bunch of thin clients out there. You know her well? Yes. No, you can print the PDF all day long. <laughs> uh, as far as like just printing to. Yeah, th that and the other thing to look at if you're trying to print, uh, there's a print screen function in all of the clients. So you can just enable that. As long as there's a printer established on the Windows environment, it'll automatically print to whatever you're trying to do. There's also, I think you can do the print to PDF. The other up. So, <laughs> so the other thing just for, for that, uh, so Vantage Point on the reporting side of it has an eventing feature so that you can take any reports that are there and send it via email via PDF. So that might be another option. If they just want to be able to do those reports, no, it's not. Not if you're behind the DMZ. Because, yes. So, Vantage Point can be installed both on the business network side and the control network side. So you can minimize the ports that are open. I focus on cybersecurity. Uh, that pretty much covers what we wanted to show, at least when it comes to discussion. Uh, now I'm going to force uh, David to work because he's, he's got a couple of demos that we can show. So Asset Center View and the Thin Manager. Uh, do you guys have any other questions of anything that we talked about or maybe little tangents while he's setting up? At this point, you don't have to raise your hand. By the way, other people have to ask questions because it can't be them too. Yes and no. There's going to be a little bit of a caveat there. So what he's talking about is the plant PX or the process library objects. So right now we're on version 4.1 of the library set. It's plant PX uh, system release 4.6. <coughs> They're not one and the same, but essentially the process library objects are all the AOIs that get launched inside of the uh, Studio 5000 environment. And then the HMI also has their own kind of face plates that tie into those objects. You can do updates while everything's online and make modifications. The issue that you run into is from a thin manager environment and everything else, it doesn't care. Because at that level, you're just providing it content. If you make modifications to the library set, if you're doing upgrades, in most cases, it doesn't cause issues. The problem is usually when you're making modifications and making changes. So, because the AOIs, as everybody knows here and has glared and yelled at me, we can't make modifications with that, uh, AOIs online. You can overwrite or do changes to an AOI, you just can't replace them. And you can't make modifications inside of the code. So if you take it from a 4.0 to a 4.1 version and replace everything on it, it will automatically replace everything. And as long as the points don't change on the HMI side of it, all of that will still work. Your issues that you have to do is make sure that you're matching the 4.1 image set, let's say, on the controller to the 4.1 face plates that would exist on the HMI so that you don't have any wire framing issues and things of that nature. It can be done. I would not recommend it, but it can be done. The, so the other part that I would argue with that and I know where you're coming from on that one. It, because it's a process system, there are times where there's no need to upgrade. There's no reason to go away from a 3.6 library to a 4.0 library just because. 
Most of the time it's a feature set side of it. Patching is usually either on the security side or anything else. The way that the screens look are usually outside of that scope. But if the argument is we need to do all of this, as long as you can update both of them from the server side of it and probably test it offline first, you can do all of that while you're online. It, as long as the controller is redundant. Is, is usually like if you needed to do firmware upgrades and stuff like that. If it's just the AOIs, you can do it all online and you don't run into any issues. Yes, actually the system release 4.6 of Plant PX is all based off version 11 and version 31 of Studio 5000. Yes, yeah, you can always move up. It's the other way that's an issue. <laughs> we're going to get ready to start our demos, but one thing I want to let you know, next month's topic, we're going to talk migration solutions. We're actually going to have some, some new stuff to show. We've got, um, we've been talking for years. We wanted you to migrate all the PLC fives and you guys have done a good job about that, but now it's time to start hitting the SLCs. So we're going to cover some new product. I mean, new, you've never seen before product at that meeting. So, give you some more ammo to go after that old slick business. And we'll also talk about some of the new migration. We do have Micrologics migration to Micro 800. We're gonna talk about all that. So um, we'll have our invite for that out probably in the next two weeks. All right. Thanks, Mike. Wow, okay. <laughs> All right, um, so I'll, I promise to be brief. I know it's we're almost approaching one o'clock, but just wanted to show a little bit of product today too, uh, to coincide with our discussions. Um, what I'm running right now is a uh, cloud-based demo. So if you guys, you know, if you don't want to install an asset center system, but you need, but you like to play with one, this is one of the cloud-based demos that would be available to you guys. If you're interested in running it, just let us know. Um, Rockwell has a nice cloud-based system. There's 20, 25 different demos that we have. Uh, there's a several on Asset Center, and so this is just one of them. So just let us know when we can spin it up for you, and we can run multiple instances and different th different kind of things. So, so what we're looking at here is an Asset Center client, and this is a really small system. So essentially, all we have is one controller and one. Uh, and one HMI system. So it's very simple. So, and uh, we have, so this is two, a total of two assets. Um, it may be difficult for you to see. This is my ACD file. So this is my Studio 5000 project. I'm gonna tread lightly because this demo is more suited for factory talk and I've crashed it several times. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tread real softly on the, on the Studio 5000. Uh, but Studio 5000, that was probably one of the earliest support for Asset Center. What's new that we've talked about today is the deep integration with Factory Talk View SE. And so, so that's what this, um, what this uh, uh, asset is here. So if I'm a user, I can right click on the asset. I can check it out. So we talked about that concept. If I check it out, I check out this version. I can do, my, uh, I can do what I need to do on it and then I check it back in. Um, there's also other things you can do. Um, you can, get the project and that's more of like an override feature um, if you need to circumvent the check-in check-out uh, if you're an administrator that's we talked about that some today um, so etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's your that's your use so if i check it out i can right click um, i can check it out it asks me to make a comment i click ok i can get a local copy i can do all my things and then i can check it back in at a later date a later time um, so that's kind of the user interface. Now, if I can go into the design mode, I click design and I get, um, I see all my, uh, assets down here that I can add. So the question earlier, is it just Rockwell? It's not, there's other things like ABB robots and FANUC, uh, robots and, and different things. Um, but these are all the different, different items I can add. And so with, with new, with factory talk view SE, the latest version uh, is now fully integrated. 
So you can see that down, down there on the list. Um, and I happen to have my schedule tab open here. So when I, if I click on, um, on any of these assets, notice I have a controller and an HMI scheduled. So the schedule means I can schedule a certain time that I do a back, and, uh, and th the event here, you may not be able to see, but this is, says backup and compare. If I click on the HMI here, um, and I wanna do a, a compare right now, I can just hit the run now button, and that will initiate my uh, going out, looking at the directory, grabbing the files, doing a compare, and then creating a report. And that takes a few minutes, so I'm not gonna wait for that to finish. But, in most um, cases, what you'll do there is if you're setting a, a backup and comparison function once a week, if you know somebody's gonna go and do work on a specific item, whether it's an MOC process or whatever it might be, you don't necessarily have to run the entire schedule mm -hmm. or you don't have to wait until the week goes in and just go in and say run now. So you can set this up based off where everything is located. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're running there. Um, some more things to see. Um, I, can I can click on my logs tab or I can, yeah, try to. Fingers crossed, again, we're, this is a cloud system, so we keep our fingers crossed. So here's my, la here's my log, um, so I can get all my information here. I can click on anything and see. Go to the audit log next to it. Yeah. We're so the event log that you'll see there is gonna be based off the diagnostics. So that's kind of your system information. Are you healthy? Is there something going on? Are you doing a backup? Did you find a comparison? The audit log is more based off the actual environment. So who's making modifications, who's tying into the changing the set points, all of those information pieces that you're doing there. If you try to log in and you fail, it will also track who's trying to log in that they failed. And this is the information that is now available on Trend Pro as well, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, so yep. and we'll look at that uh, in, in a minute or two. Uh, so what else? So we have, um, we can also click on archive. And so here's my archives. Give it a second to update. And one thing to keep in mind is the assets that you're tying into to be able to do the back and compare do not have to be local. So we have quite a few systems right now that we're looking at pipelines where all of the assets are through a microwave or wireless. The connection to the device itself doesn't have to be high bandwidth. The, the only caveat with that is the asset center server, the agent, and the client all have to be on the same network, not behind firewalls. But when it comes to the assets, those can be behind firewalls all day long because all that we're opening up is a TCP IP port for the Rockwell communication. So it's that one port just to be able to tie into every single one of those units. And at that point, we've been able to do five to a thousand units all throughout the Permian and a couple other places when you start talking about being able to just touch and make sure that they're getting the backup into one central location. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so on the archive, um, notice it just counts up the versions here. I didn't have to create a new name for it, like we said in the presentation. So I, if I wanna go from version nine to version seven, I wanna open version seven, I can right click on it. I can select uh, show an application export window and go ahead. And so um, I can export the whole application, but I can also export pieces of that application. So I can click on inside the server name, the little ellipses there. There it goes. So I can go into quite a bit of detail on all the different types of files and all this. So if I really, if I only want to export the screens or if I only want to export the database or the alarm setup or, or et cetera, et cetera. You can really kind of parse that out if you're really looking, if you want to look at something that you did a long time ago that maybe you overwrote, this is where you would do that in a, in a lot more um, finely tuned sort of, sort of uh, way. And the other thing that's really important to look at is there's a little checkbox there that says export the factory talk directory. So a lot of the times when we were doing a backup of the HMI, we would always forget the directory. We always did the HMI, which all the, has all the screens, the data connections, the alarm and events. But then we try to re-put that in, onto another computer system and you don't have the username, security, all the policies. So now this will automatically do a backup of the factory talk directory at the same time that it does the HMI. 
So that's a really important step that most people, unfortunately, I made the mistake multiple times. Yeah, so there we are. Okay, so, all right. So that was, you know, that's basically it. I mean, that, that's, you know, we're not doing a full demo, but that's basically what the new stuff in Asset Center looks like. Um, the other piece that we'd like to show um, with a few minutes left is uh, Factory Talk View SE version 11. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, and let me go to the right screen. So this is just the overview screen. I think I'm gonna jump right into Trend Pro. So we talked about that. That's probably the, one of the biggest additions uh, to version 11 and we should see some data publishing. Okay, so, um, so this is our trend. Um, as you can see, there's also alarms um, and events that are on the trend in real time. So, so um, I thought I saw this, thought this was a nice addition to a to a real time analog trend is the ability to to overlap events directly mm -hmm. onto it. And then you see down here, I believe, uh, are some of the audits, the audit database that came that is linked directly to Asset Center um, on the on the uh, on the trend window itself. And like, like we said before, um, we added, so we added the asset center. We also added OSI Pi as a data source directly into this tool. So if you had an enterprise data that you wanted to look at at the rock, at the USE HMI, you can do that. In addition to live data and, and, uh, and the uh, Rockwell uh, historian. As well. yeah, I think I mentioned this in passing, but I didn't really focus on it. One of the options that you also have in Factory Talk View 11 is you can now do production events. As, so there's an alarm and event server, if you guys have ever seen that. Typically that was for your alarms. So now what you can also do is if, if anybody's ever asked to be able to do kind of an audit log of who's going in, what button pushes are happening and you didn't have Asset Center, you pretty much needed to try to dump everything into a historian or a data log. Now what you can do is for those simple events, so whether it's somebody turning something on, boiler turning on, push buttons, digitals, you can now set those up instead of being alarmed, you can just assign them inside of asset center or, or alarm and events as an event. So a production event, and that can be brought in into the trend. So now you no longer necessarily need asset center if that's all the functionality that you need. Asset center will still go above and beyond because it's gonna track everything but if you're just doing some simple little audits and you wanted to do everything encapsulated, this will now do it in one trend environment. You said no more. So Trend Pro itself, probably not necessarily, but we are looking at different avenues. So we've gotten into the analytics space. So we have some IoT plays that are going in. We have some other functionality. So if you guys have seen kind of the portfolio, there's now a Factory Talk Innovation Suite. So for anybody that has gone to Automation Fair last year, it was kind of prevalent all over the place. We have an entire suite that ties in with the factory talk side that gets into more of the IOT, whether it's edge analytics or more of the data center side of it. We're putting a lot of those tie-ins on that side of it where you can kind of do the applet idea. So once you get your data set and you want to orchestrate the data, you can kind of pick and choose what you want to display it. And then if you wanted to do Py, uh, Python or R, any of that, we will have some of those tie-ins on the HMI side on the local. We're gonna have to define how far we wanna go into opening it up into this side of it to tie in. Right, because it, and, and realistically, right. Yeah, because OSI Pi, we partner with them. So we handle the site-based side and everything kind of downstream where they handle usually more of the enterprise side of it, which is where our kind of analytics package plays more, uh, more in line with the top or end side. So we're, we're pretty much doing everything that OSI Pi does on the top end side. And we're limiting when we start talking about, we have the historian SE, and then we also have historian ME that sits inside of the chassis. 
that's the other kind of option that we have there. Right. Yeah, because basically once you get into the IoT and the edge side of it, all you're trying to do is send data from everything that's there, decide on something, and usually have a single piece of information stream that you're sending out. Well, if you're doing everything at Asset Center and Historian from a local side of it, then all I have to do is send over the single stream of data that I want. So I am doing everything at the edge. It just depends on what your infrastructure looks like. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so um, that's in a nutshell the demo for Asset Center uh, that we have here online. We also have um, on the desk here we have our Thin Manager demo and apologize for the folks that are online because it's not connected to my uh, computer, but this is a kind of a, a a uh, thin manager demo that we have that's that we that, that we can move and we can take the customer sites and etc but this is all sort of an all-in-one encompassing oh I've got an echo all of a sudden oh that's me oh, are you are you sharing do I need to share I shared now I'm trying to figure out how to get <laughs> uh, mute your laptop maybe Can try that. Is it gone? No. Don't you love technology? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. So anyway, I, I may just turn off my microphone and talk. I, I think that works. Virtual screening. Uh, I think I've, I've shown, this is a little bit of movie magic for the people over here. This is running on my laptop versus that one, uh, just because we wanted to be able to show the people on, online. Um, all I'm running is the newer Plant PX library set that we were talking about. So that's the 4.1 process library. There's a sample code that's inside of that. I'm just running it off of emulate. Uh, the other ones are factory talk view SC applications. So if any of you have ever installed factory talk view SC, there's always an option for InstaFizz. So you've probably seen that multiple times. InstaFizz already comes with a little application that you can run. It's just running all emulate. So essentially my server setup is about four emulated controllers on a Windows uh, virtual image. Uh, and I'm also cheating a little bit because this is a virtualized thin client. So it's all on VMware. So if I look at the overall environment, this is my Windows box. So I am running Thin Manager. I'm currently running the full client on there. So I can do your standard install of your client or you can do the virtualized Thin Client environment because from a Rockwell point of view, it's the exact same thing. I don't care where I'm launching the client. It could be Windows, it can be Thin Client, I can do multiple. And when I'm looking at my Thin Manager environment, all that's doing is sitting on top of it. It's a graphical interface and I'm essentially configuring three main pieces of data. Where I'm getting the information from, 
So Mike showed it at the very beginning where the content is coming from. I will have my remote desktop boxes. So that could either be a full uh, terminal server, remote desktop box, or it could be just my HMI server. HMI server, engineering workstation, any computer that's on your network, all you need to do is give it the credentials. So I create a connection to the back end side of it. If it's the Wonderware box, I just need the credentials to the Wonderware box. I don't care where I'm getting the data as long as it's on the network. Cameras, any type of IP camera, there's a list from Thin Manager on our Rockwell website that says everything that we can connect to. So I think it's like motion, JPEGs, and a bunch of other stuff. So there's a little IP camera that we launch on that guy so you can see, see the real time information. And then VNC server. So all of our panel views, whether it's the panel view 5500 or it's the six and seven panel view plus, have VNC enabled. They will be disabled by default. So you have to enable that feature set, but there's no licensing that goes with it. Once you enable it, I can grab it from Thin Manager and I can mirror the copy of your panel view on a thin client environment. So whether that's a tablet, a phone, or a full thin, uh, full thin client, you're able to see all of it. And you can do click, point, do everything's there. The other option is the display clients. Once I have connection into the server or to the computer, what do I wanna launch inside of it? So think of the little calculator app that runs on the computer. If I wanna just give you the calculator, I just give you the calculator. If I just wanna give you the factory talk view application, I only give you that. In most cases, I'm not providing the Windows environment to the operators. Now that is a huge benefit. Because if I go to that screen and close the client, there's just a black screen behind it. It will automatically log itself back in after a few seconds if it sees that the application closed. So the clients, the operators can never go in and start playing solitaire. The other, the last thing that you're setting, and like I said, you're defining the client, you're defining the device. I can set my profiles here and what I'm looking at is under this wired profile, so what David said is I had the virtual, uh, virtual screening. I set up a little profile and it showed me every single one of these little boxes. So if I go through this, it shows me the definition of what I was looking at. So th those little five boxes that are the same ones that are there, what I have in each one of them, what the size resolution, so if it's a 4K monitor versus a, just a standard HD, tells me exactly how big something is. And then I can kind of pick and choose what I, which one I want. And the little gray box, if you guys can see it, is defining which one I'm looking at. So by default, when this guy launches up, what do I want to display there? And it can come from the exact same server or it can come from multiple. So all I did was define a bunch of different setups. And then I think my main... Uh, we prefer it that way. It doesn't require it, but it's usually Active Directory. You set that up in the policies of Factory Talk. So by default, you're doing by the device. So you, you set up the MAC addresses. You can do pass forward where you don't care about the MAC addresses. You just care as long as you can hit the IP address and the username. So once you have this set up, you can kind of mix and match. If I needed to make any changes to this, I can simply just go to the client, right click on it and restart it. If I restart the terminal, I'll go back to my little virtual thin client. It killed the session off because it's restarting the virtual thin client. And essentially what I'll do is within 30 seconds, it launches everything back up. So if I was to make any type of configuration changes, you can do that from a maintenance box push all of your changes out into the field and all it does is it automatically restarts. The only time that you have to physically go to the unit and reswap over is if you're doing a full firmware upgrade to those. And all that is, is it's gonna take a little longer. So you can still do the restart from the main box, but instead of 10 seconds, it might take 20 seconds. Uh, and again, the main idea here is if I'm doing something at the thin client environment, and I'm typing something in and the box itself dies, I take another one out of the box, pop it in, it'll automatically get the same configuration, same IP address, and you can go back to typing.
That's about it, guys. You are welcome to come play. You are welcome to ask more questions as long as you keep my booty. For everybody online, I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to me. Show of hands, how many of you guys are actually thinking about going to ticket? I mean, ticket, uh, automation fair. I got one. Is it? Nobody else is going to automation fair? Considering the weather right now, it might still be hot. Are you going to go to PSUG or are you just going to go to uh, automation fair?